You're watching the Everything Network. Isidore Blumenfeld, commonly known as Kid Can, was a Romanian-born Jewish-American organized crime enforcer based in Minneapolis, Minnesota for over four decades. He remains the most notorious mobster in the history of Minnesota. He was associated with several high-profile crimes in the city's history. He was tried and acquitted for the 1924 murder of cab driver Charles Goldberg. Blumenfeld was also present at the scene of the attempted murder by Vern Miller of Minneapolis Police Department officer James Trepanier. Blumenfeld was also tried and acquitted for personally firing the murder weapon, a Thompson submachine gun, in the globally infamous December 1935 contract killing of Twin Cities investigative journalist Walter Liggett. He was also unsuccessfully prosecuted in federal court for both conspiracy and racketeering in the mobbed-up hostile takeover and dismantling of the Twin City rapid transit streetcar system during the early 1950s. Blumenfeld was convicted of violating the Federal Mann Act in 1959 and of attempted jury tampering in 1961. After a short prison term, Blumenfeld retired to Miami Beach, Florida where he and Meyer Lansky operated a real estate empire. He remained involved in organized crime until his death and left behind an estimated $10 million fortune. With the onset of prohibition, Kid Can and his brothers Harry Bloom and Jacob Blumenfeld, alias Dandy and Yiddy Bloom, were transformed from small-time hoods into major organized crime figures in association with the American Mafia. By his 20s, Blumenfeld and his brothers held considerable power over criminal activities in Minneapolis and oversaw bootlegging, illegal gambling, prostitution, extortion, and labor racketeering. Neil Carlin has described their organization as led by the kid on machine gun and Harry and Yiddy Bloom on brains. Their ties to the Chicago outfit and New York City's Genovese crime family date back to the Prohibition period. According to a later trial, they would legally import industrial-grade alcohol from Samuel Bronfman's distillery in Montreal, which was shipped across the Great Lakes to Duluth, and then driven on souped-up Ford automobiles to the A La Pompoudor perfume factory in the Twin Cities. The brothers also ran illegal distilleries in the forests near Fort Snelling. According to historian Elaine Davis, Kid Can and his brothers, like many other organized crime figures from the Twin Cities, Chicago and Kansas City, made frequent trips to Stearns and Morrison counties to purchase Minnesota 13, a very high quality moonshine distilled locally by Polish and German American farmers with the collusion of local politicians and law. Davis writes that the main go-between connecting local moonshiners with organized crime was Melrose resident Chick Molitor who lived with his family on a dairy farm near Big Birch Lake. The Blumenfelds, with whom Molitor had a very close business relationship, visited the area so often that they allegedly owned property south of the Rock Tavern in Melrose. According to Twin Cities crime reporter Paul Maccabee, Kid Can's rivalry with Minneapolis's Irish mob ended after he and Irish mob bosses Big Ed Morgan and Tommy Banks divided the city with a handshake. Number of deaths are attributed to Blumenfeld and his gang, including journalists who were killed after writing articles exposing the inner workings of his organization, as well as his ties to corrupt politicians from several parties. A Jewish restaurant owner who recalls this era once said that the Blumenfelds were worshipped by several generations of neighborhood boys. There was a high degree of political and civil corruption in the region in the 1920s and 1930s. The mainstream newspapers hardly mentioned what was going on, as any outlet that published articles critical of the status quo was threatened. Some small tabloid newspapers attempted to report what was going on, but reporters and editors quickly became targets. Howard Guilford of the Twin City Reporter was shot and killed on September 6, 1934. Sports journalist Sid Hartman, who grew up in a poor Russian Jewish family in North Minneapolis, was an 11-year-old newspaper peddler when he was brought by Minneapolis Tribune Street circulation manager Joseph Katzman into the upper room at Jack Doyle's restaurant on Hennepin Avenue between 4th and 5th Streets. At the time, 
The restaurant was downstairs and upstairs was one of the largest sports betting operations in Minneapolis. Kid Can, Tommy Banks, and the Berman brothers were regular visitors, and Hartman's decades-long friendship with them began during those years. From their headquarters at the Flame Jazz Club in Minneapolis's Washington Avenue Gateway District, the AZ Syndicate also committed many other crimes. According to Hartman, Kid Can would bring in Sophie Tucker, Cab Calloway, entertainers like that, to appear at his club. Then, after hours, they would close the doors and the real show would begin. One time, the cops came barging in at 4 a.m., took us all out, and put everyone in the paddy wagon. If they had booked me with the rest of the people, I probably would have made the newspaper and lost my job at the Tribune. I did some begging, and the cops let me go. On August 23, 1933, a federal grand jury in Oklahoma City indicted Blumenfeld for money laundering. The $200,000 ransom machine gun Kelly had received following the kidnapping of oil man Charles F. Herschel had been traced to Hennepin State Bank in Minneapolis. Blumenfeld was arrested and transported to Oklahoma City to await his trial. Minneapolis Police Chief Joseph Lemire traveled down to Oklahoma City to testify in favor of Kid Can, and the charges were dropped. In December 1933, the AZ Syndicate's accountant, Conrad Althan, who had become a secret informant for the Internal Revenue Service, and whom, according to Paul Maccabee, knew where every penny and body was buried, was thrown out of a car into a Dakota County cornfield and shot to death with a Thompson submachine gun. Following the end of Prohibition, Blumenfeld and his family continued to maintain control over the now legal liquor industry and owned all the big liquor stores, East Hennepin, Loring Liquors and Lake Street. They monopolized the liquor business, and that's why they had so many enemies. According to an internal FBI memo, it is impossible to operate any place in Minneapolis without first getting permission from the syndicate, and the place is operated without obtaining such permission. The syndicate sees to it that the new place is immediately closed. The most notorious murder was that of Walter Liggett, one of the founders of the Farmer Labor Party and the editor of a weekly newspaper called the Midwest American. As part of what was termed the Liggett Townley Revolt, against former Labor Party leader and Minnesota Governor Floyd Olson, Liggett began reporting on links he found between Twin Cities Irish and Jewish organized crime and senior politicians from the Farmer Labor Party. Beginning on June 29, 1935, every issue of the Midwest American printed 10 reasons for impeaching Governor Olson, including political corruption and collusion with organized crime. Throughout September 1935, Liggett reported on a wet councilmanic ring which allowed the syndicate, led by the Blumenfeld brothers, to dominate the newly legalized liquor trade in Minneapolis. During the same month, the Midwest American also published articles about Kid Can's criminal history and how associate Meyer Schulberg employed him as a salesman for La Pompadour perfume factory during Prohibition, which had switched since repeal to producing Chesapeake brand's liquors. Liggett also alleged that the Blumenfelds had been so certain that the city council would grant them a license for Lake Street Liquors that they had begun buying advertisements 10 days before the council's vote. After announcing in print that he had refused offers of both bribes and paid advertisements by AZ syndicate-controlled businesses, Liggett reported on October 2, 1935, that Minneapolis Alderman Henry Banks and Romeo Riley had both attended the prize fight between Joe Lewis and Max Baer as personal guests of Kid Can. Liggett also reported that State Liquor Commissioner David Arundel had also attended the fight as a guest of farmer labor fixer and syndicate liquor lobbyist Fred Osana. According to Neil Carlin, Kid Can allegedly claimed to fellow members of Minneapolis's criminal underworld that Liggett was using the Midwest American to try and extort money from him. Blumenfeld allegedly also believed that no journalist would ever dare to report Governor Olson's ties to the AZ syndicate and was outraged when Liggett did so. Liggett was beaten up, prosecuted for a non-existent rape incident, 
and finally died after being machine gunned in the alley behind his home on December 9, 1935. His wife and daughter witnessed the assassination as did several neighbors. All identified Kid Can as the shooter. Kid Can was indicted by a grand jury, and on January 29, 1936, his trial began, where he was prosecuted jointly by the Hennepin County Attorney and the State's Attorney's Office. Meanwhile, Kid Can's younger half-brother Jacob Blumenfeld, alias Yiddy Bloom, who many sources allege to have been the acting boss of the organization, resurfaced in Paris. In an interview with the Washington Times, Jacob Blumenfeld called Liggett's murder a terrible extreme, but what the hell? Liggett persecuted the AZ syndicate, which only wanted to live in peace with him. He was fiercely honest and became ridiculously inconvenient. Poor investigative work in a careless trial, however, meant that Kid Can was acquitted. Edith Liggett always believed that Minnesota Governor Floyd Olson and farmer Labor Party fixer Charles Ward were responsible for setting up her husband's murder. Liggett had repeatedly accused the governor in print of having links to organized crime. Although indicted for shooting dead taxicab driver Charles Goldberg, and arrested for the attempted murder of police officer James H. Trepanier, who was left paralyzed. Blumenfeld continued to avoid conviction for serious crimes. According to Twin Cities crime historian Paul Maccabee, FBI files reveal that rival Minneapolis Jewish mob boss David Berman contributed very heavily to Marvin L. Klein's mayoral campaign under the understanding that Berman would receive a monopoly over illegal gambling in Minneapolis. Therefore, during Klein's 1941-1945 term as mayor, Berman briefly eclipsed the Blumenfelds and became the leader of the Minneapolis criminal underworld. In 1942, FBI documents described Kid Can as the recognized leader of graft and racketeering in Minneapolis. They added that Blumenfeld was known to have corrupted city and county officials and has been known to harbor criminals of various types. The files also report that Kid Can often boasted that he had the Minneapolis City Council in the palm of his hand. FBI files also allege that he was involved with Bugsy Siegel in the running of the El Cortez Hotel and Casino in Las Vegas, Nevada. The December 1944 issue of the Public Press, edited by Walter Liggett-style anti-corruption crusader Arthur Casherman, featured the headline Klein Administration Most Corrupt Regime in the History of the City. A month later, on the night of January 22, 1945, Casherman was ambushed after eating dinner with a friend and shot dead on a sidewalk at 15th and Chicago Avenues in Minneapolis. His murder made the front pages of newspapers across the Twin Cities, but few in Minneapolis were surprised when the police investigation was quickly shut down. Public outrage over Casherman's murder led, however, to the first term of Hubert Humphrey, who ran for the Minneapolis mayor's office promising to be a racket buster. According to historian Paul Maccabee, however, Humphrey succeeded only in shutting down the far more visible criminal operations of David Berman and leaving those of Tommy Banks and the Blumenfelds largely unscathed. Berman and his associates then moved their operations to Las Vegas, Nevada, and left the Blumenfelds to take their place in Minneapolis. According to journalists Neil Carlin and Bob Patron, Blumenfeld and his brothers made three verbal requests to Frank Vitek, the owner of the Swing City Jazz Club at 1682 Rice Street in St. Paul, to either pay protection money to them or hand over control of his club. When Vitek allegedly refused the third time, he was abducted and was dumped with two broken legs on the county road. When a permanently crippled Vitek still refused to pay, his club was the target of an arson attack in November 1945. In response to Fitek's continued refusal to sell, Kid Can was allegedly responsible for Fitek's murder by strangulation on March 4, 1946. No one, however, was ever indicted or prosecuted. As the electric streetcar system, operated by Twin City Rapid Transit, was being dismantled in the early 1950s and replaced with diesel buses, Blumenfeld owned a 16% stake in the company. 
He was later accused of allying himself with an Italian-American farmer Labor Party fixer turned corporate raider named Fred Asana and using force to intimidate stockholders to selling. Then, following the success of their hostile takeover and the company's transfer from streetcars to diesel buses, both Kid Can and Asana received significant kickbacks while disposing of the scrap metal from the streetcars. What remained of Twin City Rapid Transit was taken over at the behest of Governor Orville Freeman by noted Minneapolitan Carl Pollard in 1960. In 1954, the Chicago Crime Commission named Kid Can as involved with the Chicago outfit in the jukebox racket. As public interest in organized crime grew over the course of the 1950s, Twin Cities federal agents and prosecutors became increasingly determined to put Blumenfeld and his associates in prison. During the late 1950s, the Immigration and Naturalization Service added Blumenfeld to the Denaturalization and Deportation Program in the hope of deporting Blumenfeld back to the Socialist Republic of Romania for moral turpitude both the INS and the FBI launched an investigation between 1959 and 1960 of Kid Can's sexual activities. According to Blumenfeld's close friend Sid Hartman, however, the federal government's pursuit of the AZ syndicate was motivated solely by anti-Semitism. Hartman wrote in his memoirs, it was okay for the Kennedy family in Boston and for some of the families that are now among the wealthiest in the Twin Cities, families living off trust funds in Wayzata to have made their money in bootlegging. But it drove a lot of people nuts that the Jews were running Minneapolis and still making money in the liquor business. In 1959, he was indicted on federal charges for violating the Mann Act by transporting a Chicago prostitute named Marilyn Tollefson across state lines to work for his prostitution ring in the Twin Cities. Although Blumenfeld's defense counsel read smoky passages from Tollefson's love letters to Kid Can to suggest that it was not just money that lured her across state lines, a federal court found him guilty and sentenced him to two years. As this conviction was being appealed, a federal grand jury indicted Kid Can, Fred Osana, and six other executives of the Twin City Rapid Transit Company for mail fraud, wire fraud, and transporting fraudulently obtained property across state lines. All defendants were convicted at trial, except Blumenfeld, who was acquitted of all 13 charges against him. In another federal trial in 1960, the IRS used ownership forms to prove that Blumenfeld, his relatives, and other members of the AZ Syndicate continued to control the Minneapolis liquor industry. He offered a $10,000 bribe to one of the jurors, but was caught within hours. When charged with attempted jury tampering, he pleaded guilty. In an interview with Paul Maccabee, FBI Special Agent Bill Lace recalled sitting with Blumenfeld as he awaited sentencing. Isadora lit my cigarette for me, took off my coat for me, called me sir, he admitted that he tried to bribe a juror at his trial. Then he said he wanted to send a nice present to my wife. It was Can's opening gambit to see if I could be bribed too. In 1961, after being accused during sentencing of ordering rigged dice for use in his Twin Cities illegal gambling operations, and of blowing up a business rival's house in Miami Beach, and last but not least, of receiving a cut of the money skimmed from Las Vegas's Sands Hotel and Casino through a strawman named Mr. Isaacs. Kid Can was sentenced by federal judge Edward Devitt to a second two-year sentence for attempted jury tampering. After his release from prison, Kid Can moved to Miami Beach, Florida with his brothers. They continued to make money through criminal activities, though they changed tack and focused instead on questionable real estate dealings. In 1967, Miami newspapers alleged that Kid Can, Meyer Lansky, and their relatives either owned or had financial stakes in 10 of Miami's best hotels. Blumenfeld and Lansky were also alleged to have set up a labyrinth of businesses, deeds, mortgages, leases, and subleases to conceal their involvement and evade federal income taxes. According to Neil Carlin, Lansky once said of Blumenfeld, I wouldn't trust that momser bastard with my pocket comb. Carlin adds, however, 
that Lansky loved Blumenfeld's brothers Harry and Yiddy, and could refuse them nothing. Kid Can frequently visited his family and friends in Minnesota. During an interview with a Minneapolis reporter in 1976, Blumenfeld denounced the federal agents and prosecutors who had put him away as his persecutors, and called his conviction under the Mann Act a trumped-up charge that involved a $2 whore. Blumenfeld added that he had recently turned down an offer to write his memoirs, saying, I have nothing to say, really. In 1978, however, Blumenfeld and his brothers were allegedly responsible for manipulating magic marker stock prices. According to Paul Maccabee, after the death of legendary Twin Cities Madame Nina Clifford in July of 1929, the AZ syndicate assigned Blumenfeld's girlfriend, Lillian Lee, to run Clifford's brothel at 147 and 145 South Washington Street in St. Paul. City directories confirm that Lillian Lee, described as a saleswoman, ran the brothel between 1931 and 1934. After several years of living together, Blumenfeld and Lillian Lee were married on August 25, 1936. They had no children, and, following her death, Lillian Blumenfeld was buried next to her husband at Adath Yeshurun Cemetery in Edina. After allegedly returning home to die, Kid Can died in Minneapolis's Mount Sinai Hospital of Heart Disease on June 21, 1981. His death was news from coast to coast. At the time of his death, Isidore Blumenfeld's estate was conservatively estimated at $10 million. According to an obituary in Time magazine, which incorrectly listed his place of death as New York City. Kid Can was also a philanthropist and, although Jewish, had donated an estimated 10% of his estimated $10 million fortune to churches, as well as to synagogues. When once asked why, Blumenfeld had replied, I believe in playing all the angles. I'm superstitious. Rabbi Max Shapiro of Temple Israel, the leading rabbi at the largest congregation in the city, and the city's most sought-after eulogist, recited the graveside services in the Kaddish in a driving rain before Blumenfeld's burial at the Adath Yeshurun Cemetery in Edina, Minnesota. Taxi driver Charles Goldberg, whom Blumenfeld shot dead in an allegedly accidental shooting during an argument over a girl in front of Minneapolis's Café Vienna in 1924, lies buried only a few yards away. In an on-site interview with Minneapolis Tribune reporter Bonnie Miller-Rubin, mourner Harry Horowitz said of Blumenfeld, he was a wonderful fellow when a person needed something. He helped out many a person who was broke, who had absolutely nothing. He never forgot his friends and he always kept the family together. Rabbi Shapiro later recalled, After Kid Can's funeral, I received a call from someone who asked, How could I possibly officiate at the funeral of such a terrible human being? And I answered, It's my belief that every Jew at death, no matter what he did in life, deserves to have the mourner's Kaddish, the last prayer said for him. So I said, Kaddish for Kid Can. If you haven't already, please take a second to subscribe to the channel, and also don't forget to click on the notification bell, so you'll be up to date on all videos released from the Everything Network.